Okay, so I'm about to start a Twitter space with Pranch and we're talking about um, open source, community, headless commerce, venture, the whole story. Um, this is the second Twitter space I've ever done. Let's see how it goes. I don't know how long it's going to be, like half an hour, longer, depends how much I've got to say. Um, but I'm going to record it, make a video for it, uh, for all of you. If you missed the Twitter space, here it is, at least the highlights. I'll probably edit it down. Right. Awesome. So, uh, Michael, let's let's start with an with an introduction of who our guest is. Right. So, uh, go ahead. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Bromley. I'm um, the co-founder, CTO, and primary maintainer of Venger, uh, the open source headless e-commerce framework. I'm from the UK originally. Come from a town called Bolton in the northwest of England. Uh, but I've lived in Vienna in Austria for the past nine years or so. Um, I've been a software developer since like, I guess my teens, I started off with um, a website for my band, like a lot of people did. Um, went on to build a, a website for my family business, uh, like a like a, an online shop. And um, yeah, I started the Venture Project about four years ago. Um, I won't go too much into that now because I think we're going to cover it in more detail later. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You're, you're from Bolton. Bolton. Do mm -hmm. you know it? Oh, yeah. I, I, I was following Bolton FC for a long time. Ah, yeah. They, they, they used to be good, I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. I think they've uh, dis disappeared into the depths of the lower leagues right now. Although I must say, but at that time, I was living in Manchester and I was, I was living right near to Old Trafford. So I, I think I was, had a, a bit of a stronger affinity with Man United. And in the Alex Ferguson years, it was easy to be a Man United supporter. That's true. That's when I started watching football and uh -huh. I, I fell in love with Manchester United as well. So uh -huh. yeah, I'm, a, I'm a Salford guy. Just like Oh, <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> right. Uh, coming back from football to, to uh, your experience. Right. So uh, you're building Vendure right now. Yeah. Right? Uh, tell us about Vendure. Like when, when did you start building Vendure and like, why did you start building Vendure? I think that that's the two most important. Things. Yes. Okay. So when was about, like I said, about four years ago, a bit more than four years ago now was the first commit. Um, why is an interesting question. So I mentioned that like, you know, when I started uh, programming, one of the things I did was build a, a shop for my family business. So back in the UK, my family has a business selling art materials like brushes and paint and canvas and so on. And it started off mail order like 20, 20 something years ago. Um, you know, a, a little, a little uh, advert in the art magazine, people would fill out the product code and post it off and they would get their, their, their order sometime in the future. Um, so then, then the kind of the internet became a little bit mainstream. We had a 56 K modem and I started building websites and, and we started, uh, you know, came up with this idea. We can use the internet. We can go e-commerce. Um, that's the thing right now. So then the next thing was like, okay, how do you build a website? So I had to figure that out. Uh, we started off with like brochureware. um, you know, just, just some photos of the products and a, a form to fill out what you wanted. I don't think the form even calculated the total. You, you had to do everything manually. Uh, enter your credit card, card details, submit your order. It would email everything to us and then we would fulfill it. So it was real old school, uh, now illegal way of doing things. But back then the laws didn't exist. It was a wild west. <laughs> anyway, so this was like, <laughs> this was like over 15 years ago. And then um, later on we thought, oh, we need a proper, we need a proper like web shop now. So. I learned PHP, MySQL from one of these huge thick slab books with a CD-ROM uh, with all the examples uh, in the back. Um, that, that book was great because it had one of the tu tutorials was like how to build a shopping cart. And I thought, this is fantastic. This is, this is just like fate is speaking to me here. So um, I did the tutorial and then just carried on building and that became our business for the next like 15 years. And that was based on that book. Um, anyway, so like, about four years ago, about four and a half years ago, uh, we were like, we need, we need something else now. Like my kind of s thrown together, like extremely amateurish, um, effort has taken us this far, but now we need to move on. We need to like get a proper, uh, foundation to build our next kind of 10 years on top of. 
so then that's when I started looking around, like, what can I use to build e-commerce? Now this is like, we're in the, we're in the future now it's 2018 or whatever. Um, surely there must be some fantastic developer tooling out there to build e-commerce. Uh, in the meantime, in, in that time, I'd, I'd moved on from PHP uh, over to like Node and TypeScript. And I was really, really shocked that there was no good solution out there if you want to build e-commerce on top of Node with TypeScript. Um, and that's when the idea formed of like, you know, maybe there's a gap here that could be filled. And that's where the idea for the Venture Project came from. Right. Interesting. And since it's uh, 2018, right, mm -hmm. it's, it's also, I, th I think it, it was a very high point for GraphQL, right? Yeah, I guess like the peak of the hype curve. Um, everyone was into, yeah, well, you know, I, I, before I started this project, I was working at a company here in Vienna, and we were building an open source uh, headless CMS. Um, and that was my first exposure to headless architecture. Um, and I was really into it that it was like opened my eyes to the whole possibilities of building things in this way. Um, so that's why I also decided it should be headless. I could kind of, I saw this as the future of where just the industry is going to be heading. Um, and then GraphQL was like something that I recently discovered and, and there were many, many things I like about it, which I think maybe we'll talk about later in more detail. Uh... Yeah, right. actually, maybe I can chime in with a question, mm -hmm. so even though I didn't raise my hand, being a bit <laughs> impolite there. But anyway, so, so you started this out as an open source. Yeah. Was that kind of a cautious decision that you wanted to do this open source? Did you always imagine that you would do some commercial also? or? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, I always imagined I would do open source. So, uh, you know, before I started Venture, I've got history doing open source for about the last 10 years, uh, kind of smaller projects. Um, but, you know, and, and as, a, as a web developer these days, open source is kind of like the default. It's, it's part of the culture. Um, almost every single tool we use is open source. There's this expectancy that um, we should be given these open source tools. Someone should provide them to us. Um, but you know, in order for that to exist, there needs to be also a, a certain group of people deciding I'm going to provide some open source tooling. Um, so part of my motivation is that I just like to pay, take part in the open source movement in the open source community to give something back uh, to this movement that, that I've got a lot from personally as a, as a developer in my career. Um, and all, I did have the idea to make it um, commercial. Uh, or to have some form of commercial aspect to it, because as someone who's maintained open source for a long time, I'm well aware that, you know, just doing it in your spare time in the evening, when you're tired, when you put the kids to bed and you've got like an hour spare before, you know, you've got to go to bed and then start the grind again, it becomes unsustainable. If you cannot make it a focus, maybe not the primary focus, but you need to be able to give it some focused time uh, to be able to maintain it especially something of the scale of what Venger is, which is absolutely huge, uh, a lot to maintain. So I, I, yeah, from the start, I decided I need to find a way that this can become my life's work basically, and I can just do this full time. Yeah, I can, I can really relate to that, to, to be honest. And, and I also think uh, given that you actually are in the space of, uh, of providing a headless, uh, integration here uh, for the commercial platform. Uh, I think it also makes sense because you are, at least in my understanding, this is relating more to developers. Uh, I, I would imagine like a person with no developer skills would probably look for more like a no code solution uh, to start start their own uh, web shop, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. Like there's no, there's no thought that Venger is trying to compete with, you know, Wix or Shopify where someone with no technical skills can come along, click, set up, fill the details in, and they've got like a nice functional shop. Um, that's that's an area that is very, very well covered by a whole bunch of solutions already. And um, yeah, we are, we are a developer framework. We are aimed at providing tools for developers to build custom e-commerce applications. Nice. I, I, I really like that, you know, uh being open source i think you can you can go with anything and and your community helps you out you know try to build it out so 
like for you uh michael specifically like did you have that trouble uh you know inviting more community members to your project to to contribute were, was there trouble you know in imparting the vision that what you're building with when you're the, the, when, the, when community contributions started coming in the well the community kind of happened very organically and almost like without me trying at first so although i i've always built this in public um i've always you know from the very first, first commit it's been public on github uh but i didn't do much in the way of like promoting it or anything for the first like year or so um because i was still just building out the the bare bones of it uh but all of a sudden i was contacted by someone say hey um i've built a project on venger and it's going live uh i've got some questions uh, where should i ask them and i was like i don't know there's nowhere to ask them this was like before GitHub discussions even existed and I thought I better set up something so I set up a slack and this one guy this Italian guy um, joined up and uh, that's how the community started really just out of necessity for somewhere to to, to ask questions and um, you know slowly it built up and after like you know six months then there was a the hundred people in slack or whatever um, and now we're at the stage where we've got about 2,000 in slack and I can really say the community's very active um, you know, there's stuff happening every day and it's uh, healthy, it feels good and it's a lot of fun. Uh, can you also elaborate more on like, why do you still want to, you know, stick to open source headless commerce instead of, uh, you know, maybe going proprietary uh, mm -hmm. in any way? Because I think, right, so there's a few reasons for this. So one one of them I touched upon, which is just actually like a desire that I have to be uh, work in open source, be part of this movement. I think it is a it is a net positive for humanity that there is such a thing as open source software. Um, if every all these tools, of course, that we use every single day, which bring like billions in value to to companies all over the world, they could of course all be proprietary and and the the kind of financial. Um, value created by them would be differently distributed um, and of course there, there are problems with with uh, uh, compensating maintainers in open source that are not solved at the same time i still think it's it's uh, un unequivocal uh, net good for humanity so that's one reason um, another reason is that there are selfish selfish reasons of course as well so when something's open source, if it, assuming it gains some traction, you've got lots of people using it, you've got many eyes on the code, people finding bugs, edge cases that you never ran into yet, but you probably will do at some point in the future. Um, people uh, helping you to, to, to document these and even to fix them, uh, sending PRs and stuff. Um, that's another reason, and it's a real reason. It, it's like, uh, it's not just theoretical. There's been, there's been many, many significant contributions to Venger from the community, which, you know, by people smarter than me who, who have more experience in certain areas, like, uh, like working at scale that I've not encountered yet, solving problems that came up for them, um, which is huge. Um, you know, it'd be something that I couldn't handle on my own. Uh, last reason I can think of is there's it's open sourcing things is a kind of a forcing function on good API design good documentation because i know that there's going to be people consuming this the the uh, the you know if i don't put thought into the api if i don't put thought into the docs it comes back to me in the end so uh that's a, a real advantage as well of, of publishing things uh, making them open yeah i actually also see that the community is quite good at actually contributing back also to the documentation particularly mm -hmm. if they see a flow in the documentation or for me not being if, uh, kind of fluent in english initially when it was just me writing the code and writing the documentation that could be uh, kind of incorrect language in the documentation itself and, and that was the first thing that i saw that people will very much jump on help improve the documentation make sure that everything is crystal clear uh, and it's just so fantastic as a starting point to see that if if it's low hanging fruit that, and, and you have real users, they are very eager to, to help fix those first simple barriers. Uh, what I do see though, and, and I would like to ask your experience on this because at least as, as our project grew over the years and, and now we have tens of developers working full time 
extending Unleash, uh, we see that having the community contributing to core features is not that scalable anymore because we, we are running so fast that it's very hard for outsiders who are not working on our project full time to keep up with our pace, but they're very eager to, to, to contribute integrations or things on the boundary. But we <laughs> find it hard to collaborate with the community on our core features. I'm not sure if you can relate to that or have similar experience. Yeah, yeah, I, I can relate to that. Um, of course, it's, you know, the, there is a gradient scale of like how accessibility when it comes to uh, having someone contribute docs being a great example of something that's easy to contribute to. Um, and then you've got things like, yeah, integrations that don't touch the core um, logic. Um, I think what I found is that um, the, the, I still get, you know, I still get contributions which are on a quite a fundamental level, quite quite core changes that community members are able to do. And I think the reason is because uh, they're working day in, day out with Venger in their own projects because it's a because it's a. a a framework that they build upon and they build with they're, qu they're quite close to some of these core um, features or APIs so it's not like a black box that they they have no idea what's going on inside I think they've got fairly good visibility down into the you know down through the stack to like the database layer and back up again so potentially it's easier easier for them especially I find it more the case with when we've got big teams like we've got some enterprise teams where there's like eight or nine developers and they're just like working on venture projects so you know over the months and years they really get a good uh, sense of finding their way around the core code so they can make pretty significant contributions uh, that's super nice to hear i think there is one more thing to consider and that's partly also to make it easy to contribute and and i think open source projects need to consider this even more than than kind of proprietary software companies because in the end, you need to kind of facilitate kind of what are our coding standards, what how do we actually want to move the direction of the product, what is kind of within the roadmap, what is outside of the, of the roadmap. And I think at least my experience is that this is, it's really hard to get right, but it's super important uh, if you want outsiders to, 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 to come in and, and contribute to the project. Yeah, it's something that I've had to think about more and more as as the you know as the project gains more users and and more especially more big companies using it wanting to contribute. Um, the roadmap is something that I just didn't have for a long time until uh, basically when I started the company around it uh, last year and my co-founder David was like, "We need a roadmap. <laughs> companies expect to have a roadmap." So, you know, there's there's, there's there's always a learning curve going on. There's always like um, you're you're always learning things and, and changing your operating basis to try and like better serve the people who you're interacting with. That's true, and and uh, on top of it, you you also have to invite uh, user feedback and make sure that your roadmap is you know up to date always, which which is actually a great segue to you know understand what Vendor two point zero is about mm -hmm. and. And you know where where you're going with the the new newly created company. I think it it wasn't a company before this. No, bef so it was up until last year. Um, it was just a, it was just a project on GitHub and and a, and a website, <laughs> and me working hard over it. Um, that was it. So last uh, May we uh, formed a company, a, a limited company here in Austria, um, around the framework. Um, David is my co-founder. Uh, he's also based in Austria in Kitzbühel. And um, yeah, we've, you know, the, the company has given us uh, the ability to kind of focus on different areas like, you know, how can we support the, uh, some of the larger users, uh, kind of enterprise or large companies who, we, who are using Venture to build on top of. Um, how can we build a basis that allows the open source um, framework to be well sustained well maintained like for many years into the future so that people can confidently build on top of it and without the fear that you know i'm just gonna get sick of slaving over an open source project and decide to do something else <laughs> which is very important <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> especially with open source i think it's it's as easy to start a project and as, as easy to stop contributing to it right 
Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really like uh, your journey up until now, especially with open source, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I mean, while we're talking about open source, I think it's, it's also important to talk about your stack, right? Mm-hmm. So you are heavily reliant on GraphQL or, or, you know, uh, what's your stack basically? Yeah. Uh, how do you so- build uh, Vendor? So Venger is built on top of uh, Nest.js, the Node uh, backend framework, uh, which is all in TypeScript. Um, the API is, well, we've got two APIs, one for the storefront, one for the kind of admin side, and they're both GraphQL APIs built on top of Apollo server. Um, the, we support like a number of different databases because we use type ORM to manage that kind of interface with the database. Um, I think, and those those are the main parts, really. Yeah, all open source, of course. So, so nice. what are you using to to for, for feature flagging then? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Maybe we need to have a discussion after this privately, <laughs> because we don't have any solution for that right now. Right. Uh, coming back to your stack. Uh, yes, I am actually super curious about the GraphQL API. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I know you. I know we were talking about it that. You know, you you sort of uh, rode the hype train with GraphQL, but uh, why why until now? Why why still use GraphQL? Why well, still use GraphQL? Well, so you know, you've got typical arguments for GraphQL that probably many people have heard before, which is things like reduce overfetching. You only fetch those fields that you actually need in the kind of view that you want to display. Uh, reducing round trip because you can join that data um, and and receive it all in one request response cycle if you want a customer plus their uh, recent orders or whatever. So, you know, those, I think those are well understood. Uh, But for me, the more compelling uh, aspects of using GraphQL are things like the tooling. So the, the fact that it has this static uh, schema and type system unlocks all these possibilities, things like code generation, um, autocomplete in your IDE, um, and especially with code generation, it was really the kind of revelatory to me when I started working in this way. You have, um, you know, you make changes to your GraphQL API and suddenly you get kind of squiggly lines in your client side app, uh, you, you, you know, your storefront. And, and um, that was like something I've never experienced before. And it's, you know, it's really powerful, like what the, what the, the guild who do all this tooling around um, the code gen, what they build is absolutely amazing. You know, it can build, generate your GraphQL hooks. It can, you know, they've got plugins for like every popular front end framework. Um, and I, to, to me, that's like a huge win in terms of developer experience and, and kind of giving you these safety guarantees. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm on this like type safety train, right? So TypeScript, I, I, I converted to TypeScript, um, back in like 2014 or so when it was like 0.8. Um, and never went back. Uh, GraphQL is, has been a similar experience for me. It's like the, the, you know, the experience of developing with GraphQL and TypeScript together is like something which it would be very hard to step away from now. Um, I'm not like saying necessarily GraphQL is always better than REST or there's no use case of REST. I don't really care about the argument, but from my subjective experience as a developer and what I hear from. Uh, other people who come into it use GraphQL for the first time with Venger. It's like wow, uh, the the speed that you can develop features, the the the, the assurances that you get that your code's going to be correcter than it would have been otherwise is really uh, compelling. That's true, and I think it it also uh, I mean the the argument uh, GraphQL versus REST I think it's it's completely bogus uh, right now. Uh, especially because both of them serve a different purpose, right? And you can mm-hmm. have GraphQL plus REST stack. You don't really need to just use GraphQL or just use REST. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the the tooling by Guild, I, I think that, that deserves a special mention. Again, Guild uh, uh, does a lot of open source themselves, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah special mention just for the Guild and, and their core gen and GraphQL yoga, right? Uh, great tooling mm-hmm. in, in the GraphQL uh, ecosystem that, that has arrived in the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. Guild is one of the kind of driving force behind GraphQL for the past several years. Big respect for those guys. 
definitely definitely right so uh michael talk uh, talk us through the headless competitive landscape you know like what exists like where where is venture positioned right mm-hmm. and and what else exists in the headless uh, landscape okay yeah so so first first thing to know is like headless is relatively new for uh, for commerce it hit the CMS world first. Um, you know, there's Contentful has been around for a long time, Prismic and uh, Sanity and a whole bunch of others, uh, Strappy. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it really took off with CMS. And uh, then a little bit later, it kind of became a big thing uh, in commerce. And the way that we can think about it to kind of position Venger in this uh, amongst all these other solutions is let's think about these like two axes. One axis is between uh, nat- uh, solutions that are natively headless and as opposed to those that are kind of, they were already around, they weren't headless, but then they kind of stuck on an API onto, onto what they already offered. So you've got like native and then you've got these retrofitted. Uh, the other axis you can think of is like self-hosted or open source, usually, usually the same, uh, versus SaaS. So examples would be like, Native uh, headless commerce solutions would be things like commerce tools, which is like one of like maybe the original headless commerce solution. Um, Venger, uh, of course, Crystallize, Medusa, Cord, Swell, and probably a bunch of others. Uh, examples of ones that have been around already and kind of retrofitted uh, an API to make them headless possible. Uh, things like Magento, WooCommerce, Shopify, BigCommerce, right? So. In that kind of axis, Venger is natively headless. Um, it was built from the start as headless with just an API and, and it's open source, of course, as we've discussed. And as to where it fits in the market, so headless in general is something that almost kind of implies projects were a little bit bigger or a little bit more complex. Um, I wouldn't necessarily always recommend it for very simple, typical B to C business to consumer type of uh, shops. If you got some t-shirts you want to sell, you know, go and make a Shopify account and sell it on Shopify. Um, you're going to get to market much faster and it's going to be easier and cheaper. So in general, like headless solutions tend to be uh, a little bit more up market. So we're, we're talking about medium sized businesses up to enterprise. Um, so Ven- where, where, where Venger fits in with this is like, it can handle any of these use cases from, you know, e- even small shops as well. We have a few, quite a few small shops that uh, are built on Venger, but then it really excels on like medium size with more uh, complex requirements all the way up to enterprise scale applications. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the overview. That's the overview. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that was a that is a lot to unpack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, I completely uh, see where where Venger you know finds a space in the headless ecosystem, and I I completely agree with you that if you know a solution does not make sense for you, you should not like increase complexity. Mm-hmm. Right? So uh, I mean, for example, uh, we had to set up our swag store, right? And mm-hmm. again, a very simple swag store with like uh, a few t-shirts, right? So yeah. uh, by the way, plug for everyone, shop.getunleashed.io. If you like a t-shirt, uh, reach out. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, send you one. <laughs> cool. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think also, you know, part of, part of the um, reason that companies choose to use Venger is not necessarily the headness aspect alone. That's, that's part of it. But it's a big part of it is the extensibility uh, because, you know, you've got lots of SaaS solutions out there, which are great. And, you know, they have the, on, on the pro side, you don't have to host anything. You don't have to worry about upgrades. You know, uh, there's all these kind of DevOps headaches that just go away when you use a SaaS, which is fantastic. On the downside, what if you want to do something non-typical? What if you want to do B2B and you've got customer groups and you've got kind of tiered pricing and complex rules? What if you want to build a marketplace? What if you want multi-tenant? There's many, many use cases which are either impossible on SaaS 
um, or you end up like patching together like 20 different plugins and it still doesn't quite do what you want and now it's like a Frankenstein's monster and it's very expensive. Um, at that point, you can just say, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to use a platform like Venger. Uh, we can have like a absolutely first class, uh, enjoyable dev experience and build exactly what we need rapidly using the tools that we love and, and we know that's the same as the front end. And um, this is like uh, where a lot of the users of Venger find it because they have needs to actually build a platform that they own that conforms exactly to their requirements and is like maintainable and can stand them in good stead for like many years to come. Right. Uh, moving forward. Uh, so you mentioned extensibility, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's what's uh, truly being offered uh, when you're using Venger. So can you also can you now go over uh, how much is flexibility valued in the ecosystem right now? Whether it's headless, whether it's using you know uh, a, a particular front end framework or even open source, like you can you can customize your dashboard any way you want to, right? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, there's two ways of looking at it. One is that if you're a developer you love to play with things and be able to do exactly make things exactly how you want you know you it's like with it's like with dot files and the way your term, terminals uh, customized and stuff like this which which is kind of nice to do but from the business perspective it doesn't really matter um from the business perspective extensibility becomes important when it stops you from achieving your goals right going back to an example of uh, let's say you're doing b2b and you're on a SaaS platform, and uh, you know you, suddenly you realize that this SaaS platform simply cannot cover your business use case, um, and it's not no longer nice to have the uh, the the extensibility factor becomes kind of critical at that point. So I would say that extensibility, when you need it, then it's one hundred percent critical. If you don't need it and you can do without it on a more generic platform, then don't bother with it, then just, you know, use something that where someone's built everything for you. Um, but there are a lot of businesses that um, in one way or another, need some aspect of it to be customized, especially in e-commerce. And I can give you another example. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll just finish off on, on that point. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, let's say the business comes up with a particular kind of special offer that they want to do. Uh, which makes a lot of sense for them as a business, like they've strategically figured out this particular kind of promotion they want to do, but suddenly they find that their platform doesn't support that kind of promotion, nor can they find a plugin which has been created by someone else which supports it. So suddenly, your, your, you know, this business strategy that you've spent time coming up with that seems like it's going to be a winner, you can't do it because of the platform. It says, no, sorry, we don't support that. And, and that's also an advantage of something like Venger. If you can think of it, if you can, you know, imagine how it would work, then you can probably implement it on top of Venger. Oh, that's fantastic. That's exactly resonating with how we are thinking as well with, with our vision and philosophy is that the product should adapt to your need as a developer, as a company or as a business, not the other way around that you often can see from this uh, SaaS vendors, closed source SaaS vendors, where you have to kind of comply to their product and their kind of capabilities. And if you cannot comply to that, you, you're kind of stuck with that tool or you need to switch tool, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And then you get into the dreaded replatforming, which is a nightmare in itself, which must be avoided at all costs. Yeah. So I, I did pay attention to your GitHub page and I see that you actually support multiple databases, which is quite impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, have you found any struggles by, by, by supporting uh, multiple database technologies over the years? Uh, well, you know, the, the trade off with when it comes to the data layer um, is and this is something you, you know, you can you see again and again on like the comments of Hacker News is like ORM versus not ORM. Uh, so we use an ORM a type ORM to manage to kind of abstract that. And that's why we can support multiple databases. I don't have, I didn't do anything special. So it's not, you know, I don't deserve the praise. It's, it's um, uh, the team behind type ORM who, who manage all that. Um, 
so we officially decided, okay, we're gonna we're gonna officially support uh, Postgres, uh, MySQL, or MariaDB and SQLite. TypeORM also supports like MSSQL and a bunch of other ones. But we we decided, okay, we'll just concentrate on those ones because we think that's going to cover basically everyone. Everyone can kind of manage with that. Um, so you know, using that tool again. We're building on the, the 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 shoulders of giants in open source. Using that tool, we're able to just uh, have this extremely sophisticated feature for free by just using what's already been written by the hard work and genius of other people. It's fantastic that it's working for you. We we also had some attempts on that initially. We were a bit earlier back in 2014, and um. We decided, uh, and, and we have done, so, so we are also using kind of an abstraction, obviously. So we are using something called mm-hmm. Knex. It's not yet yeah. a fully fledged ORM, but it's kind of abstracting away some of the database queries. Yeah. Uh, but still what we do, and, and we have done a lot of optimization still in how we do some of the queries. So, so right now we have decided to only support Postgres. It doesn't mean that mm-hmm. we will not support anything else in the future, but we decided to, to, for our sake, to keep the complexity low. And, and obviously, that do require you to use Postgres if you want to adopt Unleash. But I think for us, it has been an acceptable compromise for now, at least. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there is, you know, there is always trade offs. And there are times when I've had to kind of dive, j- jump out of the um, kind of ORMs APIs and just write some raw SQL and then have like, switch statements depending on which uh which database it is which is you know it's, it's very few and far between when we've had to do that but yeah it's always the trade-off with rms is like you're trading this convenience and abstraction for potential efficiency loss uh, in critical uh, code paths so michael uh tell me about the favorite feature you've shipped in the last year okay yeah, I, I, I prepared this. So I had a look on our 2022 uh, review blog post to see what I'd written about. And I think, I mean, there's a, a ton of good features, but I think a lot of them like are boring to talk about on a podcast. But a really cool one is that we shipped support for next generation image formats, that is WebP and AVIF. So Ven- Venger has this, uh, one of our kind of core plugins that we, we always like provide by default is uh, the asset server plugin. So this is like handling all the product images and so on. And um, it has this built in image transformation layer. So you can, you know, you can ask for the image in any size you want with query parameters, like I want it with uh, 150, I want it cropped. Uh, and you can even set the focal point. So when it crops, it crops, you know, focusing on the interesting part of the image. So it's pretty sophisticated, but it was always returning like JPEG. Um, and things have kind of moved on from there. WebP is very, very well supported. AVIF is still, I mean, you can use it in Chromium browsers um, and I, I guess it will become uh, fully supported very soon. Uh, but the, the the gains you can have in reducing the uh, the amount of data over the wire with these image formats is huge. Like AVIF in my test can be like a, th- a third the size of the equivalent JPEG. So we shipped support for this. And the nice thing is, uh, because it's built on top of this um, asset server plugin we already have, which is under the hood is powered by Sharp, which is another absolutely uh, top class uh, open source project. Um, it's an image manipulation library. Uh, so we were able to support this by just uh, adding a query string onto your request for the image, like format equals WebP. And suddenly your whole website is optimized and you've just like halved the, the payload for all your images. So that was like super impactful um, with like a tiny code change. Uh, so yeah, that's I think that's my favorite. That's good to talk about and sounds interesting. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, is it transforming the images on the fly or is it during upload time that it will then reformat to multiple formats? It transforms on the fly and then caches. Ah, right, gotcha. Cool. Mm-hmm. So if you put a CDN in front there, then it will be very, very fast, I guess, for most users. Yes, 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 yes. That's right. Wow, that's that's superb. I mean, yeah, it, especially since it crops as well, it, it does a lot in, in the same function. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's I, I think we should make more uh, make more of a uh, kind of promote it a bit more because it's quite uh, differentiated, but 
yeah, I take it for granted now, but actually think about it, it's really cool. <laughs> I, I think you should uh, submit a talk about this uh, at, at a conference or something, for sure. That's a good idea. Yeah, I've been I've been kind of searching for what I should talk about this year at conferences. I got bored of last my my last year's talk about headless commerce. I thought I'll do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael, tell me about your favorite use case on Vendor. Okay. I'm gonna can I tell you about two? Yeah, no problem. Okay, because they're kind of two. two I, I chose I chose one of them. Nah, okay. There's there's. There's two ends of the scale here. So the first one I want to talk about is um, one of our biggest users, which is IBM. Um, they, you know, I was quite surprised to find they were IBM were building on top of Venger because yeah, they maybe have a bit of a reputation of like big corporate, maybe like not so uh, readily adopting new unproven technologies. But anyway, they started building on top of Venger like quite a while ago. We've got a big case study on the website uh, for what they built. The reason I like it is because they replaced um, a kind of an old legacy commerce stack, which was using like, you know, old technologies. It was slow. It was difficult to develop with whenever they wanted to add a feature. It took a long time. Many engineers like, uh, you know, working hard to like implement things that should have been simple. Uh, it's also a multi-tenant application so they have like many internal teams who are who are kind of managing different inventories within the same application so it's complex they had to write lots of uh, custom extensions and plugins for venger and um i just think it's a great case study you know because it's it's at scale it's um they had these real world benefits like you know i was speaking to the the developers and um i was told how now they can have one developer uh, do in like a few days what it used to take multiple developers, like, mu you know, multiple uh, time, multiples of the equivalent time to, to implement a particular feature. So, and, and on top of that, they don't even have to pay a license like they used to for the software. So it was like a huge, like kind of wins all around on that one. Um, and, you know, plays to a lot of the strengths of Venger. So that's, that's one pick. Um, and for my, for my second pick, I want to go like right to the other end of the scale. Uh, and uh, there's a really cool uh, team based in Germany and they build a, they build custom keyboards, custom mechanical keyboards, like kits that you, you got to like assemble them yourself. And they, they, they supply all like the components and the diagrams and stuff like very nerdy stuff. Um, Keep supply, it's called K-E-E-B dot supply. And they, the, the reason why I, I chose them is that they really kind of pushing things uh, like kind of cutting edge uh, stack and tech that they're using with Venger. They're using Remix for their storefront. They're using heavily uh, leveraging Cloudflare workers to kind of optimize images and, and routing and stuff. Uh, and on top of that, they are major contributors to the Venger community and um, to Venger itself to, to you know, with pull requests and, and issues and, and helping in the community. So they definitely deserve a mention. Nice. I, I actually ended up on Keep Supply a couple of months ago looking for some ah, caps. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I've come, hey, across nice Venger. I've come across Venger and I, I didn't even know it. <laughs> no, it's out there in the wild. I mean, you know, I've got, I don't know how many projects are out there on Venger. There's, there's, I know a fraction of them that people actually tell me about, but I'm sure there's like a whole load of them out there that I'll never even learn about. Interesting. Uh, that actually brings me to, to my next question, really, because you, you mentioned that Keep Supply is, of course, you know, using Venture, but at the same time, they're also contributing to Venture, right? They're mm -hmm. building out their, uh, maybe their own features and, and whatnot. So, how how does your community contribute to venture like what, where are the parts where where you know they fill up um yeah so i'll start off with the example of the the keep supply guys um so they decided to build on top of uh, of remix and so so in uh, in venture we've got like a few um starter kits for storefronts so in like remix uh quick uh, angular and uh, and svelte kit um and they use the remix one but then they kind of ran with it and like 
added like tons of features and and one of their developers has basically taken over maintainership of our remix storefront so that's huge for me because like i'm not really a react dev and i didn't know what i was doing so to have someone who actually knows what they're doing taking care of that one aspect is a huge load off for me um so that's a great example of contribution but there's you know there's many ways that people contribute uh, like helping on slack people ask questions all the time we've got a help channel um I'm often answering questions, but not all the time. It's becoming increasingly common, uh, much to my delight, that I see a question and I also see at the same time someone else answered it, which is absolutely fantastic because it means I can spend more time doing other things like, you know, developing new features and stuff. So helping on Slack, just being part of that kind of community. Sorry, I just got a call. Can you still hear me? Okay, good. Um, I hung up on them straight away. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, bug, bug reports, um, docs improvements, feature requests, just feedback on like their usage. Um, and as I mentioned before, that we've had like a lot of very significant pull requests, um, you know, at all kind of levels of the framework from, from like kind of surface things or like little fixes here and there to like really kind of architectural improvements at the very core of how it works. I think that, that also stands true for uh, the Unleashed community as well, because uh... I mean, I'm I'm not too technical. I I understand technology, but I'm not too technical. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, even if I don't know the answer, uh, there's somebody else in the community who does, right? And each community mm -hmm. has has built out a few SDKs. Uh, some of them start building out SDKs, and you know, uh, are are happy to help maintain, uh, you know, existing SDKs. So and. And of course, there are feature requests, there are bugs, there are customizations. So I think, yeah. you know, community help, community is literally the backbone of, of uh, building an open source uh, product. Definitely. Oh, and I've just, I've just noticed, I've got to give a, a personal shout out right now to Giorgio, who's listening, because he is the maintainer of our Quick integration. So um, if you ever heard about this new framework, Quick, uh, absolutely groundbreaking kind of paradigm shifting new front end framework. Um, Giorgio has been working with me closely over the, like the last, since, uh, since last summer when we met at a conference in Berlin. Um, and now he's like really running with this, with quick and integrating quick together with Venger. So that's a, a prime example of community. And he's now here in the, in the chat to support. So that's great. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Giorgio, for, for attending this place as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't heard of Quick, though. Uh, oh. I, I think it's so difficult to, you know, keep up with the JavaScript frameworks. Th that is true. That is true. But, um, you know, there's always like this, the, the trope of JavaScript fatigue and, oh, yeah, the what's this week's uh, latest JavaScript framework going to be? Um, but really there's there's a few there's a, there's like a, a crop of new frameworks right now which are, are i i feel are kind of shifting things forward from the kind of the the era of react angular view to what's coming next and they're really focusing on on, on like uh, how do we um kind of bridge this gap between the server and the client uh, how do we push uh, the, the, the computation of the stuff, uh, not storefronts, but just of these client side apps out onto the edge so we can run them like close to the user, like edge computing. And uh, Quick is one of these, like it's Quick, there's Astro, there's Remix and uh, a bunch of others like Fresh from the Dino team. And um, yeah, it is hard to keep up, but um, it pays off if you, if you keep up, you, you know, you, you, you get to learn about things that are really kind of pushing the industry forward. That's true. I agree with that. Uh, well, we, we got sidetracked a bit, but uh, yeah, uh, coming back to the Venger community, uh, tell me, Michael, how can one get involved uh, with the Venger community? Yeah, you can, um, you know, join our Slack uh, community. There is a link on the Venger website. If you click on the developers um, menu, uh, then it's got like links to GitHub support and then the Slack. So that's like an open invitation. Everyone can join. Uh, that's a good starting point. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of contributions from issues and bug reports and, and suggestions, uh, to things like just talking about Venger, spreading the word, uh, 
tweeting about Venger, blog posts, uh, word of mouth, tell your fellow devs about it, do a meetup talk about Venger. All these things are like make up the community. So, uh, you know, I support every, every every kind of action towards towards the community. And if you want to know what to do or what's needed and wanted, just get in touch with me and uh, we can talk about it. I think the the easiest way to contribute is to uh, talk about Venture, uh, you know, on on your favorite social media platform, or or just uh, uh, you know, drop drop Venture a star, right? Definitely, yeah. I mean, we we are very, you know, we're kind of grass we're grassroots. We are uh, built by developers for developers. Uh, I, hopefully, I speak to developers and speak your language. It's my language too. And um, this is the kind, you know, d developers are, are hard to please, but if you can kind of, uh, you know, the, the, they, they trust each other, they trust the the recommendations and word of a fellow developer. So it's very valuable for Venger if, if people can just like talk about it and um, share their experiences about it, because that helps to um, raise the profile amongst other developers, which is who we're building it for in the first place. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. Right. So now that we're talking about the venture community, I, I just have like one last question for you. I think mm -hmm. we've, we've been doing this for over an hour right now, and this is probably the hardest question that you'll get on this Twitter space. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> right. So why should uh, why should a developer or, or literally anyone uh, get involved with the venture community? Why should they contribute to uh, the venture community? Um, all right. My answer to this is because because we number one we care about the community. The community is not an afterthought. It's not a, a marketing tool. It's not a gimmick. It's not just someone. It's not just like some forum that that languishes. That the, the, you know where help and support questions go to die. No, it's it's active. It's alive. It's a lot of fun. You're going to meet uh, lots of developers from all all parts of the world. All kind of skill levels and um, all walks of life uh, so that's one thing it's just fun it's 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 good to be part of um and you know like with any kind of oss uh, involvement like i mentioned before there, there are also reasons why it's good to join for yourself um you can if you're using venger you can help to fix your own problems share the results um you can find opportunities be that like job opportunities or just building up a network uh, from my own personal experience being involved in different open source projects has allowed me to speak at conferences, travel around the world, meet lots of people, opens up like job opportunities, um, just, you know, in general. Uh, and this is just a, like a kind of a life advice, if I'm qualified to give that, is is communicate more. Um, if you communicate more, then um, you will open up more doors. And being part of a community is just fundamentally comes down to communicating uh, you know, with more people and helping more people. So I don't know, is that a good answer? That's why I'm in the community anyway. I, I, those are all the things that I get out of it. No, no it's definitely a perfect answer. <laughs> I mean, your, your experience shows, you know, why, why did you choose to build a community around when you're in the first place, right? Uh, instead of, instead of simply building a product, you're also building a community of, uh, of, developers of practitioners who are involved in headless spaces in, in commerce spaces and mm -hmm. you know, want the best for uh, want the best way to sell their product and yeah i think there are yeah. a lot of developers just like you who who would be interested in doing so and there are <laughs> that's why you have a Slack yes. community that's why you have you know uh, github and, and uh, so many developers contributing to venture all the time awesome so uh Last call for questions. Uh, uh, if you have any questions about Unleash, you can add uh, Ivar uh, as well, or you can tag Get Unleash. Of course, uh, we'll be happy to answer. Oh, uh, cool. Giorgio has requested to uh, come over. So I have a question about uh, Venger. And what is your haha -ha moment of the 2022? Building this uh, this e-commerce, at least e-commerce. Was that aha moment or ha ha moment? <laughs> so the moment that surprised you most. The, all right, 
uh, yeah I don't know. I, I guess there was a few surprising moments. So the first one that comes to mind is that um, I was approached by a guy kind of cold uh, messaged on, on LinkedIn of all places. Uh, now, I'm not like a big LinkedIn guy. At least I wasn't. I'm kind of now I'm a CTO. So I guess I kind of am a LinkedIn guy. Uh, but I wasn't really a LinkedIn guy back then. And I got messaged by someone who's like, I'm interested in Venger and I want to use it in my agency and so on. Anyway, back and forth, back and forth, ended up becoming my co-founder, David. So I w that was like a, a very surprising mo moment when I realized uh, I've got a co-founder now. I'm a, I've got a startup and it's because some like random guy messaged me on LinkedIn of all places. <laughs> I would love to know. Uh, I would love to know what he asked you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, I, I can condense it into a minute. So basically, he had uh, he, he's got an uh, also an, an agency that builds uh, custom e-commerce stuff, and his devs found Venger, evaluated it, and they were like, "This is so much better than what we're using right now. We we all want to use it." Uh, and then he tried to kind of sell it to a client. Oh, we want to build your next project on Venger. Uh, what's Venger? I've never heard of it. Oh, it's this new framework. Who builds it? Oh, it's some random guy in Vienna. It's open source. And like, nope. So, <laughs> so it was really trying to solve a problem here. Like, how can we how can we build some credibility around this project so we can actually use it? So our developers can have fun while they build their stuff instead of tearing their hair out for twenty four hours a day. And the solution was, let's build a company and let's really go for it with this project. Thanks. That that's perfect, and that also explains the partnership program. Yeah, that's that's uh, you know we we're getting more and more. I mean, yeah, more and more agencies are finding Venger and wanting to use it, and we're just kind of thinking about how can we support them best, and that's what the partnership program is all about. That's awesome. That's awesome. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Georgia, for that question. I mean, yeah, <laughs> really good question. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, your um, for sharing your experience. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jojo. <Great. laughs> awesome. All right, and uh, I guess uh, yeah, it's it's been over one hour ten minutes. I I think uh, it's time that we set you free, Michael. Thank you so much for Thank you. joining us on this uh, Twitter space. It was a pleasure to have you. Right, and it was a pleasure to have everyone in the aud audience today. Right. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in right, uh, and asking questions and reacting uh, to whatever we had to say. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation right, and learned something new about uh, open source, about headless commerce, about venture. And again, a big thank you, Michael Endivar, for tuning in. Thank you very much for having me. I had a lot of fun.